All right, our session is now being recorded. Welcome everyone to uh, our mixed methods discussion, our webinar for today. My name is Ryan Rominger, and I appreciate seeing everybody that's come uh, tonight for the webinar. Uh, we're going to focus mostly on uh, uh, dissertations. And what I mean by that is in my examples and in some of the challenges, I'm going to focus on challenges for dissertation students and the examples I use are going to be dissertations. Um, but I definitely encourage uh, ongoing conversation throughout. If you have questions, feel free to jump in. Um, you don't have to hold them. You can hold them till the end. I'm going to have a question period at the end, but if something comes up, it's a burning question, feel free to uh, jump in. Uh, I'd rather have it be dynamic and rather than a sage on the stage, but uh, we'll make whatever we can of it tonight. Uh, any questions at this time before we start in? Ryan, this is David Schroeds. I was wondering, are you going to enable chat and uh, be able to pay attention to that, or should we not use that? Uh, you can go ahead and use chat. Uh, I will keep an eye on it. Uh, thank, great question, David. Um, and if I lose track of it, which is entirely possible, feel free to just unmute yourself and, <laughs> and let me know. Um, if you yeah, use a lot to watch. What's that? It's a lot to watch. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, yeah, especially if I get off on a train of thought. <laughs> um, if you click the, the raise hand button down next to the uh, video and the audio, it will show up more prominently on my screen. Um, so that's a way of catching my attention, too. So any other questions as we start? All right, well, um, you can see my credentials there. I'm Associate University Chair in Closer, the Center for Leadership Studies. And we used to have uh, educational research at the end of that. That's now shifting to organizational research. So we're going from C-L-S-E-R to C-L-S-O-R. Uh, that's a, a change that is in the making, but um, that's the title that I have up there right now. I'm also adjunct faculty. I, um, can, have been working with dissertations at other universities for now over 10 years now. And I'm also a therapist in training. So the agenda for today is to give a brief context for the discussion on mixed methods and talk about some of the main types, talk about those pesky yet informative symbols and boxes that you might see in some of the dissertations. Um, or that you might use in your own research. Uh, and then dissertation examples. And I have that in a larger font because, again, I want that to be one of the, the primary foci for tonight. And then questions. Some of the uh, mixed method texts that I like to refer folks to, I particularly like Cresswell's work. And when it comes to mixed methods designs, he is a primary author. Um, and I think he's done a lot of good work. I happen to have uh, met him and appreciate uh, just his, uh, his thinking around these topics. Uh, I don't think he's the only uh, authority on, you know, in the field. Obviously, there's lots of others that are writing about mixed methods, and you're welcome to use those as well. Um, one of those, uh, for example, uh, Tasha Corey and Ted Lee are also prominent uh, authors. In fact, I think they wrote some of the first articles uh, really extolling mixed methods research before Cresswell uh, did. And But the Handbook for Mixed Methods and Social and Behavioral Sciences is one that I refer uh, students and, and other researchers to that are interested in mixed methods research. And of course, we have the Journal of Mixed Methods Research, which is actually studied, uh, started rather by Cresswell and, and his team, uh, Plano Clark probably as well. Some of the assumptions with mixed methods research is that uh, often from a philosophical um, perspective, it's, it's more in alignment with pragmatism. You use whatever method that gets you the data, which really answers your questions. You know, you're starting off with uh, certain research questions because of a gap in literature and then a um, question that has come up for you that you've established. And in order to answer that question, um, pragmatism would say, you know, use whatever means that you need in order to answer the question. And that might be um, quantitative, might be qualitative, or a mixture of, of the two. 
and mixed methods designs is that mixture of the two. Uh, also, another assumption is that by combining quantitative and qualitative, it helps minimize both the, uh, the problems within both of those. Um, so quantitative inherently focuses on numbers and tends to become more removed from lived experience. So the qualitative adds that piece. A purely qualitative study can sometimes get a little too subjective or interpretive. And so the quantitative piece adds that other dynamic. Um, However, if the mixed method study has poor design, then you end up with the problems of both of those designs that not, won't necessarily overcome um, the problems of both designs. You'll end up uh, with more problems than you really wanted. Um, but a good, quality, or a good uh, mixed method study can have the strengths of both coming together to overcome those problems. And then another assumption is that by combining qu uh, quant and qual, you really triangulate a phenomenon um, in order to understand it better. Now, I use triangulate in, in quotes there. We're going to talk about triangulation a little bit more um, later on, but uh, I'm using that kind of in a loose term. Uh, by that, I mean you're looking at it from different perspectives as a, you know, looking at the different faucets of it, different um, pieces and doing that in a way that is using the quantitative and qualitative. Again, if not well coordinated, uh, to use a metaphor, it, rather than two blind people feeling the same elephant, if you know the story of the five blind people feeling an elephant, rather than feeling the same elephant, you could end up with one person feeling an elephant and one person feeling a lion. Um, in other words, you could have um, your data collection targeted at collecting data about completely different things. So you really need to have that coordination and again, coming back to that, that good word, alignment. Uh, you know, align your research question with your method um, and the method that you're using. Eckhart, which is uh, a dissertation, doctoral dissertation I'm gonna cover here in a little bit, uh, really expounds upon the five purposes of mixed methods research. And I like how uh, the author does it in, in this dissertation. I would recommend for those who are interested in mixed method research, take a look at this. But now those five different purposes of mixing research are, again, the here we come back to triangulation. Triangulation is really to confirm results. You're looking at one phenomena from different angles. Um, so you're looking at convergence and corroboration and using the quant and qual strands to get that uh, corroboration of uh, really understanding the one phenomena. Another purpose is complementarity. So rather than just targeting, uh, kind of thinking of a triangle focusing inward, rather than that, you're kind of elaborating and clarifying a complex phenomena or set of phenomena, uh, plural. And you're gaining information about the different faucets of that phenomena. So rather than all pointing in towards one points on a triangle, you know, it, it might be pointing outwards or pointing in different directions. Uh, a third purpose is developmental. You might have a study where the results from one section of your research really point you in the direction and inform the next set of data collection and analysis that you're doing. So your quant, quant um, data collection analysis might inform your qual, qualitative um, data collection. Um, then there's the initiation piece. Uh, that's the fourth purpose. And Eckhart says that you know this isn't always intentional. Uh, sometimes you get results that you're not very sure about. There's some dissonance within your results, and you need to add another strand of research in order to kind of understand what you're looking at. The fifth purpose is expansion. Sometimes uh, methods are added to increase the scope. Um, you add those different strands and not measuring the same phenomena, you're expanding beyond the initial question, potentially. Um, when it comes to dissertations, some of this is difficult because uh, you want to make sure that your dissertation student isn't you know, expanding outside their scope and going to take 10 years to finish, right? So um, some advanced researchers who are working on projects that uh, are iterative, you might see some of these things like expansion, development, initiation, um, whereas for uh, dissertations, you might more often see the triangulation and complementarity 
purposes um, within the mixed methods research. Otherwise, it gets unwieldy and, and students you know, take forever. Let me pause and see if there are any questions in the chat yet, um, or if anybody wants to jump in here. And not seeing any, I'll continue. So some of the main models, and again, I'm coming mainly from a, Quest, a Cresswell perspective. Uh, he talks about the sequential mixed methods. This is where you uh, collect one strand of research, the quantitative, for example, and then the second strand, the qualitative, or the qualitative, and then the quantitative. They're in sequence, one after the other. And it seeks to elaborate or expand upon the findings from one method to the other. The other type of uh, main model is a concurrent mixed method, and that is where their data is being collected and analyzed at the same time. So it merges the quantitative and qualitative data strands, uh, and it integrates them. And depending on how you structure it, it can either integrate them at the data collection um, phase or the analysis phase, or you can um, collect your data and analyze it separately, although essentially at the same time, and then bring your conclusions together at the end. There's a few different ways to do that within the concurrent, but, um, but essentially you're collecting your data um, sets at the same time and not relying on one to inform the other. And then there's the transformative mixed methods designs. These often use an overarching theoretical lens or umbrella to provide the framework. You can collect multiple types of data to answer questions about that uh, topic um, using that theoretical lens. And this is particularly important for interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary studies, uh, according to Cresswell. For example, in psychology, the lens could be queer theory and you might be investigating the expression of gender uh, among transgender individuals in early adolescents. But you really start with that, that theory, a uh, theoretical lens of, of queer theory before moving into the, the collection of the data. For research questions uh, within mixed methods, you really want to think about how you're going to structure your research questions. Part of this is, is looking at how you're going to collect your data. If you're going to collect your qualitative data first, you might, when you're writing up your uh, proposal, or your students writing up your proposal, have them write out the qualitative research question first, if that's the first uh, set of data they're going to collect, and then the quantitative, and keep it in that sequential order if they're using a sequential mixed method design. If it's concurrent, then you have the question of, okay, which one is going to be weighted more? Is it the um, quantitative that is weighted more heavily, or is it the qualitative? And whichever one's weighted more, then you can have that be your first research question. However, most often, um, even with sequential designs, you might have a general research question that overarches the entire study, and then the more specific research questions that are um, targeted with the quantitative or qualitative strands. The main thing is just to have folks be really clear about which research question and which strand are going together. Or it's possible that um, one strand might, might be answering multiple research questions. Uh, Armando, I see the hand going up and down. Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah I do have yep. an observation or a question sure. better yet. Yeah. Um, I, I do teach a statistics class and I'm a URM and I, 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 I see a variety of different students with different expertise. And um, some, of, some of the students sometimes struggling with a particular design method. And when a student comes to me and say, I want to do a quantitative, I mean, uh, excuse me, a mixed method, of course, right? The, the, the right answer is, right, you, the, me, the method you do depends on the research question and what is that you're trying to research. But on top of that, I also advise that uh, a, a mixed method is going to be um, a double expertise. They're going to need to know quantitative, and they're also going to need to know qualitative. So this is the question. Um, 
if 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 uh, when is exactly that you absolutely need to do a, a mixed method? Can you um, can you actually bypass the quantitative portion and just do qualitative and still get the results you're looking for, or is absolutely necessary that you need to do the quantitative, just in case you find somebody that indeed the method may be pointing into a mixed method, but the expertise or skills of the student um, may not be really up to the task of dominating two methods as opposed to concentrating in just one. I don't know if I made myself clear. Yeah, and uh, you're, you're exactly right. In fact, on my challenges slide here at the end, um, it's, I, I specifically mentioned that, that you have that a person who is engaging in mixed methods research uh, has to be good at both quantitative and qualitative, or at least decent in qual quantitative and qualitative. Um, if they are weak in one of those, then they better have really good support, either on their committee or you know, uh, an advisor or somebody who's going to help them. You know, most often what I see is qualitative folks who want to add a quantitative piece and they're weak with their statistical analysis. And so they'll need to uh, rely on somebody to help them with that statistical analysis, um, in my experience anyway. But I think you're absolutely right. You need to be very aware of what your skills are as a researcher. Um, for those of us who are faculty and doing mixed methods research, we might have a team-based approach where one faculty is strong with quantitative and another is strong in qualitative. And then um, within those team-based approaches, you can have different people holding the different expertise. Um, yeah, uh, you're right on par right there. Uh, th and to answer the second part of your question regarding when is, when is a question definitely mixed methods, um, that's a little bit trickier to answer because research questions can be tweaked. You know, you can have a particular topic you're working with, you can have a gap that you're trying to address, and you can tweak a question so that it is more appropriate for a particular method. You know, a, you can tweak it so it's a descriptive qualitative method like phenomenology, or you can tweak it to be you know, a quantitative um, research question, but that really, um, it's again, coming back to that word alignment, you have to make sure that your question that you're focusing on is aligned with the method. And it's only when you have a research question where you, it really doesn't fit just quantitative or just qualitative. It, it seems like you need both of those for some reason, and we can talk about those in, in a bit. Um, some of those are like program evaluation, or um, there are certain things that are inherently almost a, a mixed method design. Um, it's like you need to have the different data strands in order to inform in different ways. You know, um, but I, that's an excellent question, and, I, and let's maybe talk more about it at the end because I, th I think it's a bigger discussion. Maybe just, just let me say one more, so so you can add it up to the end. For example, I do have an experience. I was working with a methodologist when he, um, based on the skills of the uh, student, he suggested that instead of her doing a uh, multiple linear regression with seven variables with um, a, um, an instrument that actually um, aggregate the seven variables into one big variable, uh, let's call it RC, uh, relational coordination. He suggested that she better stick with just the RC to find out if the RC was um, actually predicting something. And in yeah. this case, by making it simpler, uh, he actually, this lady still is accomplishing what she wanted to accomplish is in research, but it was a little bit less complicated. So in this case, we would really keep in the the spirit of the of the of the proposal, but but but, but we made it a little bit simpler. Now, uh, that was going back to my second question. So, um, if I really truncate the quantitative side and just stick with the qualitative, just because I know this person may not have the skills. To actually do the the the, the heavy duty quantitative side, you know that mm -hmm. was really my question. How much can I do without actually 
destroying the proposal or, or maybe just I, I, I hate to say answering just partially the research because if that's the case we better stick with the whole Chaban, right but <clears throat> well yeah and in my experience um, there are a lot of students who want to conquer the world you know they they start off with questions that are so global and so large that a part of as a chair working with that student is helping them uh, hone their question down to an appropriate size so that's an appropriate size for a dissertation so they can actually address it uh, in the dissertation and that'll be an ongoing dialogue with that student is you know, can is is it appropriate to continue to hone down to tackle just one piece of this larger question? And maybe that's only doing a quantitative or a qualitative piece. Maybe you don't have to do a complete mixed method. But in all cases, that might not be the might not be the case. Uh, David, I see that you had your hand up, and then I, there's a question in the chat too. So, David, did you want to ask ask something? The only thing, and I don't want to blindside you here, but looking at it, not from the student perspective, but from the pure research perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got laryngitis a bit. Uh, are you familiar with the work you, in the plural, the group here, called Unobtrusive Measures? And um, Webb et al, basically, and I'll get you the information for anybody who's interested afterwards. But they point out the fact that different measures have different weaknesses, and that the the more you can use separate measures with differing weaknesses, the more strength and validity you bring to the research. So that's looking yeah. at it not from the student's limitation or even my limitation as faculty or as chair, but that's from the pure research limitation. Yes, absolutely. Um, I encounter this uh, as a psychologist when you're Looking at something, let's just say um, anxiety, if you're using an anxiety measure, you might have to use multiple measures to actually uh, assess the different aspects of anxiety. Fortunately, anxiety has been studied a lot, and we have uh, clinical measures that can get to a lot of those components of anxiety. But uh, sometimes you need to have for some uh, uh, some characteristic, you might have to have m different measures, each one of it, which has their own strengths. And therefore, together, they give you a better picture. So from a mixed methods perspective, it's similar. So you'd be adding, you know, the strength of a quantitative piece, and you might be adding a, a, an interview to help flesh out maybe a piece of that um, that the, the assessment didn't uh, the information that didn't give you. In fact, one of the dissertations, if we get to them, um, specifically did that with cardiac um, patients and fatigue. And in the interviews, the people were talking about fatigue in a different way that the assessments weren't pinking up. Does that, does that help? Oh, I think it does. Like I said, I didn't mean to get you down a rabbit hole here, but that's sort oh, of the no. point. Yep. Yeah, no, I think it's very much in alignment with the discussion. Thanks. So uh, Dr. Jennifer James asks, can you give an example of the more heavily weighted rule? Uh, yes. So and we're going to be also getting to this in a second, but uh, there are times when quantitative is more heavily weighted in a study and the qualitative helps the quantitative out. And there's times when the qualitative is more heavily weighted, it's given more importance, and the quantitative piece, um, like demographics or um, a simple survey, might help out the qualitative. Uh, and uh, we'll see some examples here in a minute. Um, so just to come back to the presentation here, uh, again regarding research questions, uh, try to have folks include a specific mixed methods question that can be that global overarching mixed methods question. And uh, what um, note in when you're thinking about your research question, think about where you're merging your strands. You know, is it at the data collection point? Is it the analysis? Is it the synthesis or your conclusions phase of your research when you're writing it up? Um, being aware of that helps you, at, you know, even at the research question phase as you're asking your questions, you can be aware of when you're gonna bring that information together. 
Uh, mixed methods use a lot of these different symbols, uh, and there's important concepts. Again, weighting, we were just talking about that. What's weighted heavily, more heavily in some studies, it's quant, some studies it's qual. Sometimes they're uh, considered equal weights. Yeah. Other issues to think about timing, mixing, and how the theory uh, impacts the mixing of those and the weighting of those uh, strands. So if you are coming from a positivist theory, then your weight is likely going to be more quantitative um, and the qual is going to be helping out the qualitative. If you're coming from a constructivist perspective, your weighting might be more qualitative and the quant might be helping out. Um, but so just being aware of how theory in the mixing of the strands. And if you can uh, have dissertation students talk about that, that helps clarify um, both for them and for the readers, you know, if, if why things are being mixed when they're being mixed. A plus often means concurrent, whereas an arrow means sequential. Capitalization uh, is weight or priority. If in the little box down below, you'll see that quant is in all caps. That means that quant is the uh, more heavily weighted strand in this uh, example, whereas qual in all lowercase is the least weighted. Um, just using that as an example. Uh, quant is Q-U-A-N or Q-U-A-N-T, and qual always has the L at the end, so when you're looking through these um, different diagrams. This in particular is what's called an embedded design. You have the qual in a box that's embedded within a larger quant box. So visually, um, that represents an embedded quantitative design that with a heavier quant um, perspective. So some mixed methods graphics, just to um, touch upon them. A sequential, you'll have the boxes side by side. And if it's quant heavy, it's called an explanatory design. Um, if it's qual heavy, it's called an exploratory design. Uh, there's a brief example down there. But for uh, time-wise, I'm going to skip that example. Uh, here's an example of a concurrent um, graphic. The concurrent, you're collecting both at the same time. In this case, it's embedded. So the one method is embedded within the other, and you're analyzing the findings, um, analysis of the findings is where it's being mixed. So um, just real quickly, I'm going to refer back to something called decision-based learning model um, for mixed methods design. So I, I uh, constructed this based on the, that DBL. The DBL is like a decision tree. So you ask a set of questions, and based on your questions, it helps you understand what type of mixed method you're going to use. So one of the first questions you might ask is, would a purely quant study answer your research question? Uh, if yes, then just use quantitative. You know, it doesn't have to be mixed methods. If no, then does a purely qual study answer your research questions? If yes, use a qual study. You don't have to mix the methods again. Um, but if not, then consider a mixed methods design. Another question, set of questions to ask is, do you need one set of data to inform the collection of the next set? If yes, then you should be using some sort of sequential design. If not, then you ask, will one set of data strand be primary? If there is one data strand that is primary, then you're in the embedded um, concurrent designs. But if not, then you're just using a concurrent design. All right, and will qualitative data be primary? If yes, you're looking at an exploratory design. If not, will the quantitative be primary? And if yes, if it's quantitative primary, like I was saying before, and it's, it's an explanatory design. If not, then they're equally weighted. All right, so here we're coming to dissertation examples. I'll just come over here real quick to see if there are any other questions before I go on. Um, and uh, thank you, David, for giving that source for uh, Webb and Campbell and Schwartz. So for those who uh, want in the chat, David uh, wrote a source for that, what he was um, uh, raising. So for dissertation examples, uh, I'm going to go through a, diff a couple different sets of examples, dissertations from different universities. Uh, these are not dissertations that I've been involved with. Um, but I thought were interesting enough to include here uh, in the presentation. 
this slide I have the, the word dissertation examples in red for a reason. And that's because this dissertation is a mixed method study about mixed method studies. And what this author is doing, what this dissertation student was doing at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, uh, was coming up with a rubric designed to evaluate mixed methods research. And I'll show you that rubric here in a second. But this method was an exploratory multi-phase mixed methods content analysis study. That's what he called it. And he had 12 expert participants that he worked with. He used qualitative research and then quantitative. That's why he calls it an exploratory design. So it was, uh, exploring with qualitative and then the quant was helping to um, really solidify that um, rubric. So the research question was, what are the criteria for evaluating mixed methods research? Uh, that's, uh, I think, an important question. How do we tell whether uh, mixed methods design is a strong design? One of the critiques of this dissertation, um, well, the, in the critique section here, uh, I think this was a very well-written dissertation. It's a great example if you want to use it as an example for students. Uh, it's for both method and topic or mixed method um, research. And there's a lot of alignment, again, using that word alignment between the method and the topic and the gap in literature. This person did use visual representations, those graphics of the method and the timing of the data collection and the timing of the analysis. So that made it really clear to see when and um, what he was doing when. And the methods chapter is organized by the phase of the study. So there's a very clear descriptions of the analysis based on the research questions. Uh, and, I, and that just makes it really clear. Um, if we can have students organize it that way in a similar way, I, I think it just helps. The themes from phase one resulted in a rubric that he cr then created based on his um, interviews with these 12 experts in uh, mixed methods research. And then he tested that rubric uh, in phase two. That rubric is um, right here. Oh, there's a couple pages of it. So you know, it says the purpose of this rubric, etc., up at the top. But one of the things that he notes is uh, some of the, the standards are the results of the study are clearly stated. So we want to make sure that the um, results of both the, the study overall, but also the strands um, are stated. The study's purpose statement is clearly stated. The research design is clearly stated. The methods of how the study was conducted are clearly stated. So um, it's scored from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Uh, one of the things, um, just as an aside here, as I get into this next page, you can read through that left side from the standards as I'm, as I'm talking. Um, one of the goals for uh, engaging in this study for the, from this dissertation student's perspective is he wanted to provide something that could be used in mixed methods journals to assess the articles that were submitted, you know, and also to assess other types of mixed methods research. But that was one of the practical applications is that you could take this rubric and use it to assess, um, um, you know, articles that were submitted. We could also do the same thing with gestation students, you know, use this rubric to go through and say, okay, did they uh, do these different things? Did they, for example, midway down the page, the reason for mixing in the study is clearly stated. Did the student, when they wrote their proposal, give a reason for mixing um, their uh, strands? Did they clearly state the conclusion that includes the value added by mixing and integrating the data, etc.? So for those that are interested, I would recommend checking out the rubric. Um, if you have a lot of students that you work with that are uh, mixed methods, you know, this could definitely help. All right, any questions about that particular student or the rubric? There. All right, this next dissertation, Eckhart, uh, I referred to Eckhart before. And this study was fatigue is a symptom of coronary heart disease and it comes from the University of Illinois at Chicago. The method was a series of, uh, that was written as a series of manuscripts combined into a dissertation. So this was unique in that it wasn't a, your standard five chapter dissertation. It had a literature review and then it had different articles that were embedded in it. And in fact, there were a couple of them um, that, that were written this way. 
And so from that perspective, this is a very unique dissertation. But one of the things I really liked about the literature review is that um, purposes section that Eckhart came up with and um, that, you know, just the information that it, it portrays in the different sections were it was very clear, very clearly written. Eckhart said it, it, that this study on fatigue was a partially mixed sequential dominant status design. So the quantitative was more heavily weighted. That's what that means, the dominant side uh, design. And the qual was a follow-up. She used follow-up uh, interviews with her, the patients. Um, so 102 participants in the quantitative who uh, completed measures on fatigue and mood and quality of life and all these different aspects. And then went back and um, looked, purposely sampled through interviews specific subsets who were high fatigue, medium fatigue, and low fatigue. And that provided more information about um, whether they were capturing fatigue in the right way and how that fatigue was affecting the heart disease patients. My critique of this dissertation, uh, it was a great description of the different types of mixed methods, including examples of each mixed method design uh, in that qualitative review part where she gives the purposes. Uh, she reviews a lot of different designs uh, similar to what I was doing up above here and gives examples of each of the designs, which is great. She also provides a unique approach to a dissertation, again, as I mentioned, several manuscripts uh, with in-depth discussion of the designs, the theory, the paradigms, and the mixing of the paradigms. Here is one of her tables, which I really appreciated. So on the left, you have the planning, uh, you have the domains and then the different definitions of the different uh, domains of mixing. So again, she's looking at how to assess mixed method studies. This actually is coming from uh, Ocathane, a uh, 2010 uh, chapter in that other book on, um, uh, Sage book on mixed methods designs. So Ocathane, uh, talks about the different uh, quality, different domains and how you assess whether it's a, a strong uh, mixed method. You know, you're looking at design quality, data quality, interpretive rigor, you know, whether when you're doing your qualitative interviews, whether there's rigor within that interpretation of that qualitative, uh, whether there's rigor within the quantitative um, data analysis where there's transferability within the interpretations. Uh, the reporting quality, if it's very clear, and whether there's uh, synthesizing of the different data strands as they come together. For those that want the a reference, there you go. It's Ocathane, uh, assessing the quality of mixed methods research toward a comprehensive framework in Sage Handbook of Mixed Methods. All right, another example, looking at Wright's uh, 2018 dissertation on looking at physician executives. This study, um, again, mixed method, looking at leadership characteristics and how physicians learn how to be good leaders. Wright has called this an explanatory sequential mix, mixed methods interpretive phenomenological analysis with a goal of determining physician characteristics connected to good leadership. Uh, the, in this study, he surveyed and interviewed six physician executives to discuss uh, what competencies, thought processes, and techniques are important for future physician executives. Uh, this one was a little bit odd, uh, and, I, and I put it in here because I, this is one of the dissertations I came across where I had a bit of a, uh, maybe a negative or a critical um, critique of it. Uh, the quantitative strand is fairly weak because it only has six participants. And so the results uh, are questionable, you know, it, just from a quantitative perspective. And this is a good example of if you have a mixed method design and you don't have strong quantitative and qualitative strands, it can actually weaken the whole study. And it brings into question, you know, what it is that, what conclusions you're actually drawing from the different strands. And when you bring them together, what then uh, the conclusions for the entire study are, are sound. 
uh, it limits uh, the analysis and you know it's better to have a strong qualitative and strong quantitative. Also, this person writes of it as a phenomenological study. And one of the, in my experience, one of the things that I've found is it's very difficult to integrate classical phenomenology with uh, mixed methods because the, the uh, intensity of phenomenological research, true phenomenological research, when you're working with you know, three to six participants with multiple uh, interviews and that can be very structured and very description focused, um, it's very difficult to do in a mixed method design. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it just doesn't mesh really well unless you have, um, again, those uh, good set of both qualitative and quantitative researcher skills. In this particular case, they were only single hour interviews with each participant. That makes me question the phenomenological aspect of it. Uh, a lot of phenomenologists, uh, researchers, say that you're you know, doing multiple interviews, not just single interviews. This may be better described as a hermeneutical uh, research method rather than a phenomenological because it was interpretive and um, there was only one interview as opposed to numerous. Um, all right. I'll come over to see if there are any questions in the chat. Anybody holding up their hands? Or any other comments? Ryan, this is Mansura. Can you hear me? Hey, Mansura, yes. Uh, yeah, so as you're talking about this particular dissertation, um, could you please clarify if the researchers actually need to ident identify particular design for their uh, quantitative or qualitative sections? Or they just can say, oh, this is quantitative, that's called qualitative. Great question. Uh, quite often they do not um, say what the type of qualitative design is or type of quantitative. Uh, well, I mean, I guess the I have seen more description of the quantitative strands than the qualitative often. For example, if it's a randomized control design um, or a survey study or um, you know that type of quantitative um, aspect, then that will be very clearly laid out. And I think it should be because you have your hypotheses and your null hypothesis and your testing that you're doing. Um, within a quant strand. With qualitative, often they don't say that it's, you know, phenomenological or humanitical, um, but I, you know, it's a, I would say it's about 50-50 in my experience. Uh, a lot of people mention IPA, Interpretive Phenomenological Analysis, um, since Smith came out with that book. So, um, yeah, great question. I mean, is, is there anything else that you would any um, follow up to that? No, no, I think this is a, a good uh, answer. And I just wanted to maybe perhaps clarify for our students that if they want to use the mixed method, it's fine. But sometimes by unnecessarily identifying design, they may make trouble for themselves. For example, in, in this, this particular example, like the author didn't need to say phenomenological design, right? Uh, Correct. So by yeah. doing so, actually it undermine uh, the quality of its own qualitative section because we all know that you cannot do a meaningful phenomenology with just single one hour interview. Right, yep. And I mean, there were a couple other red flags um, within this dissertation. I, th I think that um, this, is, uh, this is one of those cases where the student was thinking about phenomenology as a philosophy and as a way of looking at human experience, not phenomenological research method. And so there was some confusion. And, and so using the word phenomenological in that way, um, however, there was still an attempt to stick to the, the six participant um, quota that you often hear, you know, three to six within phenomenology. And 
so, so I don't know that the student ha was really clear about research methods in general. But, you know, sometimes we have students who that we're chairing and, and it's they're not methodologists. And that's that's just sometimes the case. And we do our best with them. But um, it's I think it's easier to not say that it's a specific design but rather say that you're doing a qualitative strand and you're going to use a particular type of analysis. You know, look at um, using a, you know, a specific, um, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of um, one of the folks who talks about different types of analysis um, right now. But anyway, you can use heuristic analysis uh, or multi-phase uh, qualitative analysis where you're, um, Anyway, there's that's a different conversation, but yes, I agree with you. You don't have to specify that much. Right. Yeah. Thank you. And I see yeah. Pat is. I think Pat, what well, she had a comment in the chat box. Let's read her. Yeah. Uh, she writes, "What is the conversation for the choice of sample from the target population? Can you use the same target population for the mixed method sampling for both sides of qual and quant data collection?" Okay. So if I'm uh, understanding the question, can you use the same participants? And that depends on what you're trying to do. If you, so um, there's been some writing recently on using um, qualitative interviews within randomized control trials. Mm -hmm. And in that case, yes, you, what, in that example, you have a study where you have your, um, you know, your control group and your experimental group and then you're conducting interviews with those different participants and you're looking at both the quantitative data, the pretest, post test data, as well as the interview data, and you're using the same participants. Okay. Now, if you have a study where you, it's a sequential study, you might be using uh, different uh, participant sets. So it might be that you interview a bunch of people in order to come up with a rubric like the uh, gentleman above who interviewed 12 experts. And then after you're coming up with a rubric that you want to test, then you might send that rubric out to, you know, 200 people and get their assessment of it uh, to, uh, to um, get quantitative data on it. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, when constructing new surveys, you might find this type of um, combination where you have a combination of qualitative and quantitative data being collected for um, to test the validity and the um, reliability, and one of those um, aspects, construct validity, you might want to get information from experts in the field to see if you're actually looking at the the target that you want to assess. So yeah, you might have different data, um, participant sets that you collect data from. So it can be both. In some situations, it's going to be the same people that you give both quantitative and qualitative, and the qualitative often will be a subset, a smaller subset. Mm -hmm. And in other situations, it's going to be different um, participants. Thank you. Is that a question, Pat? Yes, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right. So this next one, it comes from Crichton University. Does mathematics, a mathletics, a supplemental digital math tool improve student learning and teaching methods at three private Catholic schools in Florida? And here we're moving into the education domain and, and looking at testing a program that is being used with, within a school. Uh, it's similar, very similar to a program evaluation and whether or not that program is having an impact upon the students. So the method here is called a convergent parallel mixed method study. It's convergent, uh, it's parallel. So they're collecting quantitative and qualitative data um, at the same time and they converge those two strands um, at the data analysis um, stage. The quant strand used uh, comparison groups of sixth grade classes. So you had those sixth grade classes who participated in mathematics and those who did not and they assessed their Iowa test of basic skills. That's the outcome measure. And then the qualitative strand was they um, interviewed teachers. So to go back to Pat's question, here's an example of one, the quantitative strand being students, 
and the qualitative strand being teachers. So the participants were different sets. However, both were looking at whether the program that was implemented is having an effect. Right. So again, it's, it's similar to a program evaluation. The critique, uh, this is, I, I already mentioned the program evaluation piece, and it's a very clear research set of research questions for each strand. Uh, the author talked about the convergent process after the separate parallel data collection al um, analysis. And the um, qualitative in this study really expanded upon the quantitative results, and the author talked about how that um, qualitative data expanded it. It was very clear about that expansion, that it was important to talk to the teachers because they had a different perspective on how the mathematics um, implementation was working and how it was uh, impacting the students beyond just the Iowa um, test. Um, member checking was also discussed here, comparison tables. Um, I mean, it was a uh, great study that really looked at the validity of the, the different strands. Unfortunately, there was no graphic representation to help clarify when the data was collected and how it was converged. Um, that would have been something that I would have recommended, but because I, I like graphics, it helps uh, clearly articulate what's going on when. And then one example from the University of Phoenix. Um, Boyle graduated in 2018. Executive selection process of U.S. defense contractor, contractors, a mixed methods study. Um, I don't know if anybody was on Boyle's dissertation here. No, maybe, maybe not. But anyway, this was called a convergent parallel mixed methods study. Again, no graphic. Uh, there were two pilot tests and a main study in this one. The main study had 37 participants in a quantitative strand and a qual strand with three participants um, that were interviewed. The researcher did not meet his goal. Um, he ran an assessment for power um, and wanted to get 159 in the quant strand and 6 to 12 in the qual, but after months of participant recruitment, couldn't quite get up there. Um, that's not uncommon. I have a study going on right now where we're having a hard time getting participants at the levels we want, so I think we've all been there. One of the critiques is that um, the, this author made a strong argument for the use of mixed method design. Um, there was a very strong statistical argument for the number needed, uh, the power analysis even though he didn't meet his goals, which would have made the study stronger, but the, just the description and how the author approached that was excellent. Uh, there's um, the survey piece, and um, while the survey in part, in part two of it used Likert scales, it was created by the author, and there was no prior reliability and validity, but there was a theoretical lens for the questions, and um, the author did conduct a couple of pilot tests to, to test the content validity and the reliability of that survey. So he was putting that survey through the process of, of uh, as you would do uh, survey construction uh, to really generate the, the validity and reliability. So that was, that was a great piece um, of the study as well. And the qual results provided confirmation of the quantitative. And that was, that was nice to see as well. So overall, I think it was, it was a good study that you could direct students to as an example. So mixed methods challenges. Uh, it can take more time to conduct mixed methods, especially if you're doing a sequential design. If you're doing a survey study and collecting both qualitative and quantitative data through a survey, it might not take more time, but it definitely has the potential to take a lot more time. And another piece of that is how you're analyzing the quantitative and qualitative separately and then bringing it together. Um, it can take more resources, like money and personnel time. This comes back to what Armando was saying. You need skills for both the qualitative and the quantitative methods, either as an individual, as a dissertation student, or having a team-based approach. You know, and at some point, you know, at some universities, they allow team-based dissertations. Uh, we don't hear at this point, but um, you know, that's a possibility. But for those who are faculty, you can definitely take a team-based approach and have somebody a qual and somebody a quant um, person. Another challenge is d trouble determining when to merge and synthesize the strands um, or being unclear about their research questions. 
and some combinations typically don't mix well, such as classical phenomenology and large-scale quant studies, um, or theoretically the positivist and the constructivist, like a narrative and an RCT. But that's happening more and more with the um, kind of the constructivist piece, those interviews coming into randomized controlled um, trials. It's um, increasing in popularity. So, with that questions i'll open it up to the question period we got about four plus minutes left um, one thing that i did want to mention is that there are a number of studies that are inherently mixed method but we don't call them mixed method you know looking at the deli or the um a case study quite often you are collecting both quantitative and qualitative but the design is primarily um, uh, dictated by the kind of that theoretical piece that, you know, it's a Delphi because of how you're approaching it. It's not because um, you, you don't look at the data you're collecting, you look at what you're doing with the, the method. And so it might be called a Delphi or it might be called a, a case study because you the purpose is looking at cases in a case study and the different types of artifacts you might be collecting. You might have um, qualitative artifacts mixing in with quantitative artifacts um, in order to, um, to look at your bounded case you know, and then compare that case to another case. So you wouldn't necessarily call those mixed methods even though they might, well, might be using quantitative and qualitative data. Just a comment, Ryan, uh, for the audience, this recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to that channel. We do have one for this year and 2018. And also, I will be sending the PowerPoint presentation. Thank you, Armando. I just want to make another comment. Looks like um, Collaborator uh, is up to the challenge, right? We have 23 yeah. people, and uh, I haven't heard any glitches, no breaking. Uh, it looks like uh, it's doing well, and we may want to try it in future uh, webinar. Maybe we can design that we can create groups randomly, and you know, and the moderator can go from room to room, and then we can put everybody back on, on just as, as an experiment. Maybe if we want to try some sort of an interactive. Uh, exercise in the future. But it's, yeah. it's looking good. Yeah, I think that's a great idea, Armando. Well, uh, thank you, Ryan. I just want to say thank you. And I wanted particularly mention that the way that you use decision-based learning um, in some of the slides, that was very uh, effective way of explaining the concept. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, thank you. I was just starting the DBL um, integration, and and I know that we're gonna our next uh, for those who are still in here. Um, we have a decision-based learning model and software webinar that's coming up next week. If you're interested in it, um, I was just starting that process, and I think there's a lot more that I could do with the mixed methods and really parsing out which mixed method when and why. Um, I just didn't have time. I ran out of time. To, integrate more of those slides but but yeah for those that are still here please do come to our next webinar next Thursday on the DBL um, the software that Ken and his team have created is just excellent for uh, for using the DBL and for, for teaching things like research methods or selecting which statistics to use in a study and you know that type of stuff looks like we got different people typing Yes, you're welcome. Thank you for all for coming, and I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yes, very great presentation, Ryan. Uh, if you wanted to say just in one uh, statement, one recommendation to faculty member um, who are mentoring doctoral dissertations, um, if they see that their students are interested in mixed method, how would you suggest suggest them? What is your particular recommendation, if there is any? Uh, I would say that if you have a student that's considering it, um, I would say you want to make sure that that student can be very clear. And, you know, I want to use the word sensate, you know, from a 
epistemological perspective. If they can really understand when things are happening in a research process, or at least map it out, um, if they're not very sensate, they almost have to map it out and, and be very clear about how the method is addressing the research question and what data strand um, is addressing each research question as you have sub-research questions and um, when you're collecting the data and when you're bringing it together to analyze it. Um, having that mapped out will make everything flow much more smoothly for the student and um, help them keep track of where they're at in the process um, or else it's really easy to get lost and, and you know even with a singular method you know my qualitative students um, if they're just doing qualitative after they collect all their data you know they're swimming they don't know what to do or how to engage and then they have to be regrounded in order to move forward um, so it's even more so when you're in a mixed method design you have to be really clear where you're at at all times yeah, thank you, Ryan. Um, do you think the faculty members should be well experienced in mixed method as well in order to guide this study? You know, it helps, but I don't think it's absolutely necessary. Uh, I, you can bring on other folks onto the team that have other methods expertise. Um, so if you're strong in quant, have another method, you know, have your student bring on somebody who's strong in qual that can give them, you know, advice for the that qualitative method um, and, and provide feedback there. Uh, and just a comment, the, 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 new, the new dissertation model we are going to, chairs will be assigned as opposed to uh, students finding a chair, and then uh, the URMs will come uh, and they will, you know, concentrate purely, absolutely in the methodology side of the coin. And URMs are required to manage both quantitative and qualitative. And, and the new model um, is, is going to be like the chair slash URM slash reviewer will, will stick with the student all the way up to graduation. Um, it's a, that's a great difference as, as the previous model. Uh, so I guess uh, still your point is valid, right? But mostly I believe will fall into the hands of the URM that actually also can consult with another URM and even with the chair. But this new model I think is going to help uh, a lot as well. Thank you for that information, Armando. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've worked with some really excellent qualitative researchers who did not know quantitative research really at all. I mean, they weren't, and they and they would say that. They said, you know what, I'm hands off when it comes to anything quantitative. And that's fine. You know, that, that's, you know, you get some narrative researchers or, or some, you know, feminist researchers who that's all they do. And they're, they're excellent at it. Um, similarly with quantitative, you have some quantitative folks who that's all they do. So being able to consult across those lines and have that dialogue and be open to, you know, discussion is imperative at that point. Um, I don't think that everybody has to be an expert at everything. Uh, that's uh, Sometimes generalists are okay, but sometimes that makes people weak in all methods. So, you know, you got to do what, what um, works for you and what you're good at, you know. Stick to your your competencies. Uh, yeah, David. The only thing I was going to throw in there with the mixed methods is, I know of nobody who's absolutely a guru in all manner of quantitative study or all manner of qualitative study, and the mixed methods. Even if you had experience, that is such a broad number of possibilities. Um, that I, I, although I think it is a benefit, as you said, I don't think you're going to find somebody who is, is absolutely the authority on every potential aspect of mixed methods. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Any other questions or comments? A great discussion. Well, I know that I've kept you all past uh, about five minutes, and I'll let everybody go. But thank you, everyone, for coming. I look forward to seeing you at future webinars. And uh, feel free to use these webinars and the ones posted on YouTube in your classes and with students. Uh, direct them to all the different 
uh, different methods that we have been giving webinars on. And feel free to visit the Research Hub, uh, Research Methods SIG website and, and see what we're doing there as well. So thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Thank, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Raya. Take care. Good night. Bye. Good night.